settling? Uh, just letting everybody settle in and to make sure that the captions are on, etc. Just give you a few seconds just to make sure everything's set up. And then we'll get going. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to our panellists today. Welcome to everybody joining. Um, this is our first NF2 Buy Solutions webinar from the UK team. Uh, it's great to have you here and uh, thank you all very much for joining. This is going to be recorded and it's going out live as well. So you'll be able to catch up on anything you've missed as we go through. So my name is Claire Goddard. Um, I'm the wife and mother of two with neurofibromatosis type 2. That's my most important role. But I'm also the CEO of NF2 Bio Solutions UK. I'm very proud to be too. Uh, we're a registered charity in the UK and armed with global NF2 biosolutions. We are advancing gene therapy, bacteriotherapy, immunotherapies as treatments for NF2. As with the global entity in the UK, the charity is formed of patients and family with all with a link to neurofibromatosis type 2. We all volunteer our time and skills to seek solutions to the condition and all money raised goes directly to our projects. So in the next hour, we'll um, hear about the work that the UK arm of NF2 Biosolutions is currently supporting. Uh, we'll hear direct from the research lab in Manchester. Um, we'll hear from an inspirational fundraiser. And we'll also hear from our charity trustee, uh, Professor Gareth Evans, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, you've all been sending in some questions, so thank you for that. Uh, we'll be answering them as, as we go through. So we're very lucky to have support from, we have lots and lots of support with the charity, and um, we have clinicians and medical professionals um, that are helping us all the time and supporting our work. Um, and it's my pleasure to kick off this hour and introduce you uh, to Tony Jones, um, who is CEO at One Nucleus, um, one of the organisations supporting us. Um, over to you, Tony, um, to give a bit of background um, as to why you're here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Claire, and, and welcome everybody. I'll, I'll echo those, those um, warm remarks. I guess for One Nucleus, we're a, a life science membership group for companies all active in researching, discovering, supporting new medicine discovery. Uh, we're headquartered in Cambridge, um, but a big role, we, much of we support companies in seeking finance and, and operational support and insight and connections. Actually, a key part of what we do is about provoking good questions within that community. Uh, can we collectively do better? What's the best way to do things? And as much as um, we're funded by subscription from our, our 400 plus company members, actually, it's really, there is no more important question then have we got patients at the center of everything we're thinking about and doing? And so we tend to offer complementary membership to patient groups and the research charities, because that keeps the, the sanity check of what we're doing as an industry. We all have Monday morning issues to deal with, but actually there's patients on the end of this process every time, uh, whether that's a, a funding round that allows drug discovery and development to go forward, whether it's funding into a research lab to identify new ways of treatment. So if, if those things don't work, then we don't actually benefit the people who, who we're here for. So I was delighted to be asked to get involved in the uh, Find a Cure mentoring program and, and linked up with, with jo, Joanne Ward. And, and one of the early discussions was, well, how do we engage the audience more? How do we get the profile up? How do we raise the, the awareness of NF2 and how people can help? And I think there's nothing no better way of doing that than actually engaging with people to see what their questions are and then have experts like Gareth and, and the researchers as well as supporters like, like Andy on the call to think this is how collectively we can all get around this. And I think to get the insight is often best done in a conversation between experts. 
And that brings me to who I'll be handing on to in, in the form of Mike Ward as one of the, the best commentators and experienced commentators in the life science industry and has been for, for a good while now. Mike has seen trends, um, patterns of deal making and research come and go. But actually, he does a lot to engage companies in, well, are you focused? What does patient centricity actually mean? It's a nice headline to put up. But how do you walk that talk? So it was a, an honor for me, really, to be able to reach out to Mike and say, look, would you do this conversation with the NF2 guys um, to bring some of that to life, not just for the biopharma industry and the research community, but for the patients and that group as well. So without more from me, um, more than happy to answer any questions about one nucleus and getting involved, but I'll hand over to, to Mike to lead us through. So thanks very much, Tony. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure being here. So uh, my name is Mike Ward. <coughs> I'm the global head of uh, life sciences and uh, healthcare thought leadership at Clarivate, which is a company which helps academic and industry researchers accelerate their own innovative efforts. Uh, and, and we do this by, for example, tracking the most impactful scientific papers, providing you know, up-to-date information around patents and trademarks, tra tracking clinical trial activity, highlighting which companies are actually interested in, in particular diseases, for example, the deal-making that, uh, that Tony was referring to there. But really importantly, ensuring that the voice of the patient is actually heard and that their needs are focused on all along that sort of discovery, development and delivery timeline, as well as actually also helping companies understand sort of the latest uh, regulatory policies or, or also how they might evolve. In the past two decades, you know, since the, you know, the completion of the Human Genome Project, we've seen a massive increase in interest in developing treatments for rare diseases. And much of this research is, is actually conducted in university laboratories, often funded by medical charities like uh, NF2 Biosolutions. So you know, I'm delighted to, to be joined today uh, by Grace Gregory and Adam Jones, two PhD researchers at the Jeffrey uh, Jefferson Brain Research Center in Manchester, whose research is actually being backed by NF2 Biosolutions. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Adam, one of the PhD, PhD students here in Manchester, funded by NFT Biosolutions. Uh, my background is strongly grounded in immunology, having worked on the developmental origin of the blood and immune system, as well as immune responses to malaria here in Manchester. So my current work focuses on neurofibromatosis type 2 associated vestibular schwannoma, which is a tumour that grows along the vestibular cochlear nerves within the ear. So I'm looking particularly at how the immune cells within these tumours can drive inflammation and tumour growth. Um, so we're using very advanced technologies to create a deep spatial map of the tumour tissue uh, so that we are able to look at the different interactions between immune cells and cancer cells and then see if these interactions are then targetable with drugs to stop the tumours from growing and hopefully shrink them to improve the hearing of people with neurofibromatosis type 2. And my research parallels with the lovely Grace, whose work is on meningioma. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm the other NF2 Biosolutions funded PhD student here at Manchester. Um, so I work really closely with Adam and our projects kind of run in parallel to each other. Um, I actually come from a drug discovery background because previously I worked on developing new drugs for Alzheimer's disease at the University of Oxford. Um, but now I'm in Manchester and I'm really focused on working on neurofibromatosis type 2 associated meningioma. Um, so meningioma are tumours that grow on the membranes that um, surround the brain and are the second most common tumour type to neurofibromatosis patients um, after vestibular schwannoma. So I'm currently looking at how we can target the inflammatory pathways within these tumours with drugs that have been repurposed and have been validated in other diseases. Um, so our aim really is to shed a light on the inner workings of these tumours and to investigate potential drug targets that could be taken further as new treatments for those with neurofibromatosis type 2. 
Great. So that, thanks, uh, Adam and Grace, for, for, for joining me. So we've only got time for, for two or three questions from the audience. So I'm going to jump straight in. So the first question uh, relates to the role of, of inflammation. Do you think spine tumors like schwannomas and the epidemomas uh, grow due to inflammation? And if so, would actually anti-inflammatory drugs treat those as well? So almost all tumours have an inflammatory component to them. And so it's very likely that spinal schwannomas and ependymomas will actually benefit from targeting inflammation. However, this has to be validated in the lab by some of the methods that we're using now for vestibular schwannoma meningioma. But the overall answer is most likely yes. Right. And, and you know, with regards to you know, inflammation in you know, vestibular schwannomas or me mentioneoma, what percentage of a tumour is actually inflammation only? And you know, how is this sort of your best assessed and, and monitored? You know, is it you know, through MRI? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as far as inflammation in the tumours go, it really varies between tumours, um, it varies between meningioma and vestibular schwannoma, and it varies between each person too. So um, some are very inflammatory and others not so much, um, but it is likely that these uh, inflammatory components within these tumours have an impact on growth of these tumours. And as far as how to measure this inflammatory component, um, it is possible with MRI, but only with a specific type of MRI called DCE MRI, um, which is unlikely to be the form of MRI that is used to regularly monitor um, the tumours that grow in neurofibromatosis type 2 patients. Right, right, okay. Uh, and, and now I guess you're the $64,000 question. If drug candidates are identified from, you know, the sort of current inflammation research that you guys are doing at Manchester, how soon might these be available to, you know, uh, people with NF2? So this will be highly dependent on how well the drugs work in our preclinical studies within the lab, as well as how they actually work within people with neurofibromatosis type 2. But if we are able to find a drug that is effective, uh, very importantly safe and readily available. Hopefully over the next few years, there might be a drug available for neurofibromatosis type two patients, all going well. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, we didn't have too much time. So, you know, it's a shame because, you know, uh, that we couldn't talk for, for, for much longer, but, but I'd like to thank you both for, you know, sharing the insights and, you know what you're what you're focusing on and obviously we wish you all you know all the best right in in in, in your efforts um you know clearly you know it you know it's worth emphasizing that you know such research is in fact a, an expensive exercise uh and it and therefore it you know clearly highlights the importance of you know financial support from medical charities such as you know, nf2 bio solutions uh and of course, that's only possible by you know the fundraising activity and efforts of, of, of volunteers. So, yeah, you know, on that important note, I, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna hand the baton back to, to, to Claire. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Grace and Adam, very much indeed. Very important work you're doing for us. Yeah. Um, and thank you for being so communicative with us as well. Um, Grace has a blog on our website and that she's inviting patients to come along and um, put their stories in there because she really wants to open up these links between patients and research labs so you know we really want you to get involved and chat to us so do look at the website for that um, I think Joe will put the link in the chat for me um, so my absolute pleasure to introduce Andy White um, who is um, one of our fundraisers and an absolute inspiration to us so I'm not going to say too much Andy that you do the talking so tell us about your fundraiser please Thank you very much indeed, Claire. It's an absolute pleasure to, to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, maybe first of all, start with how I got involved myself, as, as with everyone, the personal connection. Um, in my case, my uh, eldest daughter, Rebecca, uh, was diagnosed with NF2 in mid-2019. 
she's 34 now, so a late diagnosis. Um, and it was a bit of a, a bolt out of the blue for all of us. We'd never heard of NF2. It was not in our family. Uh, uh, doesn't run in the family at all. So it uh, looks like it was a spontaneous mutation in, in Becker's case, a de novo case of NF2. Um, so that was, uh, that was how we started to, to get involved. Um, now, Becca has been on uh, Avastin since shortly after her diagnosis, which has been fantastic. Uh, she's uh, been lucky enough to be getting that. She's got uh, bilateral vestibular schwannomas. Um, the Avastin has been more or less keeping, keeping those in check. Uh, her left hearing is, is a bit challenging at, at the moment, and we're looking into cochlear implants uh, for that. And, uh, a hearing aid and a, and a Roger Penn uh, microphone for a right ear. She's a, she's a teacher and so she needs to operate in a classroom environment. So it's very important that uh, the hearing is, is augmented as much as we possibly can. So that, that's, that's how I got introduced to, to, to this world. Um, and it's how sort of coincided. Sorry? How much did you raise? How much have we raised? Well, uh, we raised fourteen thousand uh, pounds in the event that I've just done. So what happened was that um, uh, this this diagnosis and, and Rebecca coming uh, uh, being diagnosed uh, coincided with my sixtieth birthday. So a friend of mine, a lifelong friend, we're both turning sixty at the same time, more or less. We decided to do a, a fundraising event. Uh, we did the coast to coast, uh, the Alfred Wainwright coast to coast walk from St. Bees to uh, Robin Hood's Bay, um, and uh, and we we raised that fourteen thousand uh, pounds. That was last September, October, and um, yeah, it was it was great. I mean, we know that that money is we, we know exactly where it's going, so that, that that's great. And I think uh, I think Adam and Grace. Uh, are getting some of that in, in, in their research, if I understand correctly. So it's great to know that the money's going to something very, very concrete. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, uh, it's, 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 been a, it's been a great ride so far. Brilliant. Yeah, that money's gone directly to um, the lab in Manchester, every single penny. And um, so um, what was the most, because, you know, people are looking at this and thinking, you know, well, I'd like to get involved and do some fundraising myself. Mm -hmm. So um, have you got any good tips on what things work well with your fundraising? Was there a particular thing that was quite easy to do um, that, you, you know, just raised money well? I know that you got involved with the band as well to help raise yeah. money and you did all sorts of different things. So tell us a bit about, you know, how we can um, raise money easily, what you found worked well and, and what was fun as well. What were the fun bits? I think, first of all, a good idea, an important thing is to, is to have a narrative, to have a story. And I think that's something that really helped us. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, Mike and I, Mike was my, my, my friend, Mike Whitehouse, uh, my, my co-worker. You know, we had a, a narrative, we had a story, it was visceral, it was personal. Uh, two friends coming together. He's, he's known Rebecca all his life. Um, so it was, it was a very personal thing. And I think we were able to uh, leverage that narrative and also amplify it through social media. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a great lover of social media sometimes, but it's very, very important for getting messages out there. And you know, not having heard of NF2 myself, something that was very important to me was awareness, was, was really getting that awareness across. So I, I think that the narrative and the story is very important. So have, have something that's personal, have something that uh, engages other people in, in a story. Um, a second thing I think for me, certainly, um, Corporate sponsorship is important. Um, don't, don't be scared to approach organizations. Something that Mike himself said was that, uh, you know, people want to have the chance to, to do good. Um, and that applies to companies as well as to, to individuals. So don't be afraid to, to uh, approach corporate sponsors. We wouldn't have got anywhere near 14,000 without, uh, without Hudson, our, our corporate sponsor who was so generous, so supportive uh, of, of the whole thing. So corporate sponsorship, I think, is, is a great way to go. Um, we, maybe a few techniques as well. I mean, one thing that we, we found worked very well was that when, when someone uh, made a donation, 
Um, we, we always thanked everyone personally, individually, but when we did uh, thank them, we, not everyone, but, but, but a lot of them, we, we challenged them to identify two friends or two colleagues that weren't in our networks, so completely new to, to the story, challenge, those, uh, challenge them to find two people to pass on the story to, whether that was for a donation or whether it was just the story, you know, sending them to the, to the giving page to, to read the story and, and, and raise awareness. And, and that sort of multiplies the whole thing, which I thought was really, really great. Um, when we were on the walk, uh, we, uh, we, we had these postcards. So we had these postcards printed uh, with the whole story on the back and our sponsors as well. Um, and everyone we met on the walk, whether it's you know, just walking past them on the walk, is it, the coast to coast is quite, it's, it's a famous walk, you know, a lot of people do it. Every time we pass someone, they got a postcard. Everyone in the evening in the, in the, in the bed and breakfast, they got a postcard. And that brought lots of money in. Uh, that, was, that was amazing, but not just the money, the awareness as well. People were reading these postcards and saying, never heard of this, this is, this is amazing. Yeah, and um, I think what you touched on there with the awareness is a huge piece for people with NF2, because some people with NF2 present and um, you know, they look like they may have a difficulty, but you can't always tell with a hearing impairment. Um, you, you know what people are going through and they, it's those hidden um, yeah. disabilities as well it's so important to raise awareness and um, to get to get neurofibromatosis type 2 out there uh, so it's very important yeah it's very important to Mike and I that it was about awareness as well as, as raising money uh, yes I think, yeah, yeah. I think so we, thank you uh, Andy thank you very much for all your efforts it was a massive personal achievement for you as well you were training hard and we were comparing training notes weren't we things <laughs> well your training notes <laughs> um so thank you very much for for doing all that for us it's a fantastic amount thank you very much to hudson oh, you're very welcome very welcome more, more to come fantastic um, and on that note we have um on the 28th of february um it's of course rare diseases day um and on the 22nd of may that's um nf2 day so if anybody's thinking of uh, or wants any inspiration for fundraisers towards those events, we'll be having our own fundraisers and doing lots of different things. Um, so get in touch with us if you'd like to get involved. Right, thank you, Andy. So now um, I'll pass back to Mike um, and over to Professor Gareth Evans, who of course is a medical um, geneticist and NF2 expert. So back over to you, Mike. Yeah, thanks very much, Claire. And uh, yeah, what an inspiring story, Andy. Uh, and congratulations uh, on, on, on those That's efforts. Uh, earlier on, uh, I spoke to uh, Grace and Adam, uh, two PhD students at the start of their research careers. Uh, but now it, it, it's my pleasure to you know, introduce Professor Gareth Evans. Right. Someone at the end of their career. <laughs> I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. But, you know, for those who don't know you, you're, you're chair of uh, medical genetics and cancer epidemiology at the University of Manchester. And in the past 30 years, you know, you've established you know, both a national and an international uh, reputation you know, in clinical research uh, you know, aspects of, of, of cancer genetics, particularly uh, in uh, neuro neurofibromatosis uh, and, and breast cancer. Um, namely, I mean, you were successful, you know, you have that successful bid for this, like, you know, seven and a half million for the uh, NF2 service uh, in, in 2010. So, um, and also, as Claire said, you're a trustee of the charity. So uh, it's it's great that you you've you've agreed to 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 join me and uh, pleasure read to answer uh, questions that have been provided by you know sort of NF2 patients and their carers. So uh, the first question uh, relates to, in fact, the the the, the drug that you know, Andy's daughter Rebecca is on, you know, bevacizumab, uh, you know, the, the monoclonal monoclonal antibody also known as avastin uh it's given to people with nf2 to try and stop shrink or slow the growth of, of schwannomas the question is is there an alternative to avastin so at the moment really avastin is the only proven drug that can treat nf2 related tumors and um, I mean, it's still not licensed for use. So, it, you know, uh, the drug company have not made any efforts to license the drug. So we're only able to give it in the UK 
because we have uh, essentially equivalent to NICE approval because the highly specialized services have approved it for use, but with very specific criteria, which we have to get ratified by a partner center. So typically we're talking about a rapidly growing schwannoma, uh, which uh, would otherwise uh, result in uh, patient deficit, loss of, loss of hearing, for instance, if you had to do surgery, or a spinal tumor that would cause potentially loss of function if you took it out. Uh, so we are still um, having to give it within a relatively strict protocol, but it is extremely effective in schwannomas. The problem is it doesn't really work in meningiomas. We often have to stop treatment to treat meningiomas. And ependymomas, there, there is some evidence of that it works in cystic ependymomas. So the ependymomas, which are the tumors within the spinal cord itself, uh, sometimes we can get some really good responses if there's a cystic like, uh, component to those tumors. Right. So and no other therapies have passed any sort of reasonable bar for saying that they are effective. Right, right. Uh, so are there any new sort of you know, candidate drugs that are, are being you know, tested in trials, you know, particularly ones that you know, people yeah. with NF2 could actually join? Yeah, so, well, uh, at the moment in the UK, there is no open trial. Um, there is a trial of what's called an HDAC inhibitor, which is in setup at the moment. So that's a histone deacetylase inhibitor. They've, the, the drug company have got approval for advancement from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the States. So that's a really big step. I've been involved in setting up the protocol for it. It's a drug with, you know, which is pretty tolerable, not bad side effects. And, you know, they are the, the drug company recursion are, are very uh, enthusiastic that it is likely to have an effect on meningiomas and schwannomas. So to be more targeted to both the main NF2 tumor type. So hopefully that trial will start later this year. Um, in terms of other promising candidates out there, brigatinib, which has been in, I've seen as in the chat, that is in a trial called Intuit in the United States. There's a lot of buzz about brigatinib. Uh, it was the top candidate from all of the pipeline drugs that have been looked at. And uh, we're very, very hopeful that that will have an effect, particularly on meningiomas. But it is not available uh, off uh, it's not licensed yet because it's not been proven to be effective. But so we are anxiously awaiting the results of the American studies uh, led from Scott Plotkin in Boston. And, and, and when do you expect that to, to, to get the read out? Well, I've been trying to get an early read on these things, but, the, you know, drug trials can be quite, they have to be quite rigorous. They're only really allowed to uncover uh, in term, particularly in randomized trials, when they, they reach a particular point in terms of number of patients that have shown any effect. And uh, so it's, it, you know, I, I've not been given a definite on when we'll be told, but I imagine it will be in the next uh, six to eight months. Right, right, okay. So, I mean, that's something to, to look out for. Is there, uh, yeah, th th this is, you know, a question from the audience, very specific. Is is there anything in the research pipeline for effective treatments for children affected by NF2? So all of all of these treatments potentially can be given to children. Uh, I mean, there is usually a higher bar that's required, uh, but a lot of these drugs are repurposed drugs. So they they're all they've already been shown to be you know, tolerable in, in adults and, and, and children. Uh, the likelihood is, is most of these drugs will be approved for treatment over the age of six. And essentially, it's very rare we have to treat anyone with NF2 before six. So, so children will be eligible for most of these trials going forward. Um, and after all, you know, um, 
probably 30, 40% of NF2 present symptomatically in childhood. So it, we're, we're missing a huge chunk of who we need to treat. And if, you, if we want to prevent longer term harms of all having to treat so many tumors in NF2, then we need to get in with the treatment earlier. Right, right. And is there any specific work in hand sort of looking at you know, finding a cure for you know, schwannomatosis you know, in particular? So schwannomatosis, really, the, the feeling is, is that what works for NF2 will work for schwannomatosis because the schwannoma tumors that occur in schwannomatosis effectively have both copies of the NF2 gene uh, uh, aberrant. They, they've been damaged. And all, what schwannomatosis does is it accelerates that process, but for whatever reason seems to not do that on the vestibular nerve to the same extent. Um, and it doesn't seem to give you the meningiomas and some of the other picture of, uh, of NF2. There, there is pretty good evidence that Avastin works fairly similarly for in schwannomatosis, although mostly anecdotal. So I, I think most of the thought is that, that what works in NF2 will work in schwannomatosis, particularly if it's schwannoma driven therapy. And uh, uh, there is an EU Pearl initiative in Europe where we are lumping together NF2 and schwannomatosis. And uh, you've heard it here first, but you know we've talked about neurofibromatosis. That is a misnomer because NF2 patients do not develop neurofibromas. And there, there is a process going through to change the name. Uh, the NF2 will almost certainly stick because the gene symbol is pretty much indelible now because it's been out there for so long, but it will be likely to be NF2 related schwannomatosis seems to be the, the, what we're going with. So neurofibromatosis will disappear hopefully, because it is, it's wrong, it should never have been called neurofibromatosis. Um, so NF2 and schwannomatosis are going to be bedfellows going forward. Right. And that's right, because they are essentially the, the reason the tumours occur is because the NF2 gene is made aberrant. Right. As a, as a follow on, Constant pain is a sort of a major issue yeah. with anyone suffering from schwannomatosis. So, what advice you know would you have in, in in that context? So the main advice is to get to the you know get to a specialist centre, um, get to a good pain clinic. Um, the the thing with uh, schwannomatosis pain is it's neuropathic pain, so it's really only neuropathic drugs at the moment that are likely to work, the sort of pregabalin, gabapentin type drugs. Um, some of the antidepressant drugs work quite, quite well, the tricyclics uh, um, and um, Tegretol works to some extent, but many NF2 patients find that they just don't work and that they often just stop taking them because none of them seem to work. So. Again, there are big initiatives in, in the United States with a Synodos project, looking at trying to develop pain medications. Scott Plotkin again has a promising candidate in Boston and the EU Pearl initiative is specifically developing a basket uh, protocol to develop drugs specifically for pain in schwannomatosis. And it is really remarkable how schwannomas in schwannomatosis cause pain when they're very, very small, almost ex sometimes excruciating pain. Whereas in NF2, it's relatively uncommon for schwannomas to cause significant pain. So that really does, even though the NF2 gene is still the gene that is targeted, there is something about what happens in schwannomatosis that is different, that it targets the sensory nerves in NF2, it seems that the schwannomas target the motor nerve roots. So you end up more with, uh, with loss of muscle function when uh, the, the, the schwannomas cause problems. So you actually rarely see motor deficits, people losing muscle function and weakness 
in schwann hematosis unless the surgeon's gone in and pranged the, the motor part of the nerve. Right. So uh, the next question we've got from the audience is actually asking how could the work of NF2 Biosolutions UK, you know, support, you know, uh, Manchester, you know, help someone with NF2. But I think actually hearing what, you know, Grace and Adam actually had said and what they're doing, that, that's probably answered that question. So um, the next one uh, for you, Gareth, is uh, one member of the audience has, has noted that a number of NF2 patients in the same family seem to suffer with peripheral nerve neuropathy. Is this linked with the NF2? Yes, yeah, so there is evidence that you get a peripheral neuropathy in, in NF2. Um, uh, it seems to be sometimes linked to the tumours, but often not specifically linked to tumours. So you, uh, a peripheral neuropathy is often where you get sort of glove and stocking loss of sensation. So you lose sensation in the fingers, you start losing muscle function in the fingers and the, the, the toes. So that does appear to be a feature, and it does seem to be a feature in those with the more severe types of, uh, of genetic mutation, pathogenic variants in the NF2 gene. Um, you do also get something called mononeuropathies, which are where a specific nerve root is targeted. And you see that much more in children. So you see uh, a child develops what is thought to be a Bell's palsy, and actually it's a facial weakness that never fully recovers or a wrist drop or a foot drop. So we have a number of NF2 patients who thought they'd had polio in childhood, but they never had polio. They had a mononeuropathy as associated with their NF2. You sometimes get them in the eyes affecting the, particularly the third cranial nerve can cause the eye to go out and the, the, the eyelid to come down a little bit. So there are a number of, of these mononeuropathies, again, which are more common in childhood. Peripheral neuropathies tend to happen more in adulthood. Mm. Uh, another question for the audience. To what extent do hormones affect the tumor growth? Uh, so in terms of the, 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 the hormones that the most work has been done on is really estrogen and progesterone and the feeling that women may have more of a problem than men. However, there really is pretty uh, slim evidence that that has any impact on schwannomas. In fact, men actually have a slightly higher incidence of vestibular schwannoma earlier in life. And, uh, and there's no evidence that there's any difference in severity of schwannomas between men and women. For meningiomas, it is a little bit different. In fact, it, it's, it's odd that boys have a higher risk of meningiomas than girls, but once you hit puberty and, east, and progesterone starts to go up, then that causes more meningiomas in girls and uh, women sort of overtake men at around 20 years of age and they're more likely to develop multiple meningiomas and the meningiomas can be a bit more problematic. So progesterone definitely for meningiomas, it has been a target of anti-progestin therapy. Again, not particularly uh, convincing results, although some patients still remain on anti-progestins and that seems to have possibly some benefit. Uh, and the men of after the menopause, meningiomas tend to be less aggressive in women. So that again would fit with there being uh, a hormonal element to it. The other sort of slightly unexplained thing is why puberty seems to be quite a big trigger for growth. We know that vestibular schwannomas that are identified in very young children rarely grow very fast. So, uh, you know, they, they, they just go, they're tiny tumors. Now, now there are exceptions, but most children that are followed, young children that are followed up, they do not really start to pick up their growth until puberty. And something about puberty triggers growth. So the most rapid growth we see with vestibular schwannomas in NF2 is in children from about 13, 14 years of age up to about 25. And then, then the vestibular schwannomas tend to grow less fast. We do not know what it is, 
but it is likely to be something hormonal, growth hormone, no real evidence for that, but something hormonal around puberty that triggers particularly vestibular schwannomas to grow more rapidly. Right. right. Nobel Prize, if you find out, Grace or Adam, what it is. Yeah. So uh, in the past decade, the, the, sort of the, the harnessing of the immune system to, you know, to target and suppress tumours right, has, has, has come on you know, leaps and bounds. Do you think such immunotherapy approaches could actually have a role in treating or even, even curing NF2? So there has been some work done on this. Matthias Karyanis's group published uh, a f- quite a long time ago now, about eight, eight or nine years ago, a paper looking at uh, immune modulation in schwannomas and meningiomas and found that actually schwannomas, there was a high proportion of NF2 related schwannomas that appeared to be potential targets for these checkpoint inhibitor drugs. Uh, And that really fits again with the work that Grace and Adam are doing. These tumors, the, the, the growing schwannomas are packed with macrophages. So they are inflammatory tumors that are potentially targets for the immune system. So, so definitely that there, 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 there is thought that that could be something that might be effective. These are very expensive drugs though, uh, checkpoint inhibitor drugs, and you know, they're not without side effects. So there might be more straightforward, simple ways of, uh, 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 of approaching the inflammation that Adam and Grace are really looking at. And can we actually find an inexpensive drug that's got lots of uh, lots of evidence behind it and lots of safety behind it that we can use to target that particular aspect. The only other area where NF2 related uh, is there is uh, there, a small number of mesotheliomas, which are the asbestos driven lung cancers, are driven by NF2 mutations. And, and again, there, there has been some evidence that, that checkpoint inhibitor drugs have been effective in particularly NF2 related mesothelioma. You'll be, you'll be, uh, the audience will be pleased to know that mesothelioma in NF2 is not a particular issue, but don't go around exposing yourself to asbestos. No, but that, that, that'd be, you know, you wouldn't want to do that anyway. But so, sort of, you know, looking at sort of the- I, I was very silly when I was a boy, I used to play on these asbestos roofs. So I'm not sure how much asbestos I exposed myself to. Right, right. So, it wasn't really known then, though. <laughs> no, the, the, just talking about the sort of you know the use of checkpoint inhibitors. Is it, so? Do NF tumors are, are they expressing you know PD one or is it other? So uh, that is targets? that is what Matthias showed that they appeared to be overexpressing PD one. Right, and uh, that it was the majority of schwannomas from that study were overexpressing PD-1, whereas meningiomas, it was, it was much less clear. So, so that's why, but there's really been very little work since, and I'm not aware of any study where PD, uh, where checkpoint inhibitors been, have been used as, as a treatment in NF2. Right, right. I guess I mean you, you're right to to point out that you know these checkpoint inhibitors at the moment they're expensive, but they will come know, within, down. Prices within, will come down within ten so, I years. I mean, when when Avastin came off patent, the yeah. the the price dropped by yeah. seventy uh, by seventy five percent. So yeah. it it was hugely less expensive to treat with Avastin. Yeah, yeah. So that there's, so there's all so all this work that's been done elsewhere. There there will be a sort of you know a, a, a there will on, be yeah. from benefit. there will be a benefit from that. Yeah, yeah. So another sort of scientific breakthrough um, in the past decade has has been the sort of the advent of gene editing uh, you know, yeah. techniques such as CRISPR Cas9. To what extent do you think such approaches might benefit people with NF2? Well, obviously, the underlying problem is is a a, a gene mutation. Uh, And if you can correct that gene mutation in the appropriate cells in the body, then potentially that's a cure. Um, But it it, 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 so so absolutely that is something that could be really, really helpful. But it's 
making sure you correct it in the right cells in the body in enough cells in the body to make a difference. So it's not like curing cystic fibrosis where just getting enough of the uh, of the cells fixed that you produce the right protein is good enough to help someone. You need to be correcting the mistake probably in over 90% of the cells to really make a difference in terms of preventing the formation of schwannomas, meningiomas, ependymomas, et cetera. So that is the, that's the, the bar. The bar is very high in preventing tumors because you have, it's, it's not good enough to get 10% 10, 10 of cells corrected. It needs to be 90% plus cells where you correct the genetic fault. Right, right. Uh, one, one of our audiences has picked up on the news that you know, drugs developed to treat AIDS and HIV might offer help to patients with meningioma and, and, and schwannoma. How quickly do you think this observation could be translated into a, a, you know, a possible treatment for, for NF2 patients? And, you know, and could it actually be a possible treatment for children affected by NF2? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the antiretrovirals, really the, the sort of HIV, the HIV the treatments uh, are very tolerable, very few side effects. You know, people take them for life. So potentially, you know, it, it, it is, it, it's, it's a promising target. I, I mean, this is preclinical work that suggested that these, these drugs may be effective. Um, We've been trying to go around the world asking people, is there anyone out there with NF2 who's been on these drugs so that we can actually see if there's been an effect? And we would need, you know, to build up enough patients to, to give at least some clinical out, outcomes. But uh, we're now asking, you know, is there, is there anyone out there with meningiomas or just isolated meningiomas or schwannomas? And, and we picked up a few, but not a, a vast number. So the next step would be uh, to do, if you've got enough clinical information, you could go straight into a sort of phase two trial. Uh, but otherwise, probably what you're going to need to do is something called a phase zero trial or window trial where you treat with a drug uh, and then ideally if you've got a, a tumor under the skin that you can take before and after uh, treatment to see if the drug is getting into uh, the schwannomas is having an effect on the schwannomas so you treat for maybe three months and then harvest a tumor before and after treatment so those sort of window trials are a quite quick way of finding out whether the drug is effective and would be then you could maybe go into a phase two, phase three trial. But if we have no human data out there uh, and it's just test tubes, then really we need to have some solid human data before going into a bigger study because these are expensive trials and we need a bit more than uh, you know, a, a cellular model to tell us whether or not it's going to work. Yeah, no, sure. Um, I'm obviously that's a, that's a challenge in uh, a lot of uh, sort of drug discovery, drug development. One, I mean, this is something that <clears throat> you kind of alluded to a, a little earlier in our conversation. Yeah, you know, the sort of the challenge, you know, in getting access to sort of exciting and new effective uh, medicines is is potentially the high, yeah. high cost so i just wonder so how confident are you that you know new nf2 treatments you know based on gene therapy or immunotherapy would be available through the nhs i'm just thinking because you know you you were once uh associated with nice and they're the kind of like the arbiters of what yeah. is you know cost effective so yeah. i'd be just interested to get your perspective on you know you know, well, I mean, you know, the, the NHS is 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 not as as miserly as some people think. I mean, just today there's been a big splash about the NHS approving the most expensive drug of all, which is uh, 
a gene therapy for met metachromatic leukodystrophy, you know, which costs three and a half million. So, you know, uh, obviously the NHS does look at orphan diseases and NF2 is an orphan disease and will definitely, uh, you know, be open if there is good evidence a drug is effective. And that, that's, we've been able to do that with Avastin. There was enough evidence from Scott Plotkin's work in, in, in Boston that we were able to get that approved. So if the brigatinib trial is, is effective, I am very confident we will get brigatinib into the NHS relatively quickly. And we do have an advantage in the highly specialized services that it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to go a full through a full nice appraisal. And, the, you know, the bar is a little bit lower in terms of cost effectiveness than the bar is for, uh, for you know, for standard things like breast cancer treatment or bowel cancer treatment. You know, for orphan diseases, the bar is, you know, you, 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 do, you don't have to jump quite as high to get to get a drug into the into the into the nhs oh, i'm sure that that's that's sort of comforting news you know be, be, be reassuring um uh, uh to, to to the audience and I, I know this sort of you know question which i clearly is a sort of front of mind for 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 a lot of of, of the audience is what is the current state of, sort of research associated uh you know with with deafness and 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 nf2 so obviously, the, the most of the research in the last sort of 20, 30 years has been trying to rehabilitate people with auditory brainstem implants, cochlear implants. We, we're finding that, you know, if the cochlear nerve is preserved, that cochlear implants are really a very good option. You get very good uh, ability to interpret sound with cochlear implants. ABIs are much less clear because, you know, ideally you want to be going to the cochlea and passing the information down a nerve through established pathways to the brain rather than sticking electrodes into the brain itself, the brain stem itself. But there are some people with, you know, really quite good uh, 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 results from, from ABIs. In, in terms of Nerve regeneration, you know, that is certainly something that's been it that is being studied. You know, is it possible to regenerate the cochlear nerve? Um, and you know, if if nerve regeneration studies become more promising, then absolutely we, you know, regenerating the cochlear nerve would be something that would be looked at. But if it's not there, then then that's a problem. Um, you know, it, it's it's more. Uh, now, we know, for instance, that, and I think there were some other questions here, that, that deafness is not simply just squashing the nerve. It, it might be secretions that, is, uh, that are caused from the tumour that actually damage the cochlea itself, and it might be affecting the blood supply to the cochlea. So the cochlea is damaged because the blood supply is damaged. And the nerve is still fine. The nerve is still functioning fine. And that's why a lot of deafness can be managed with a cochlear implant. And in, there are a number of NF2 patients around the country who do really, really well with cochlear implants. But that can only work if the cochlear nerve is intact. Right, right. But there's also been a, you know, a lot of talk about the, sort of the, the gut microbiome and its influ it, you know, influence and in inflammation. So I wonder whether this has sort of prompted the sort of the next question in, in terms of, you know, to what extent do you think diet plays a role in the growth of you know, NF2 tumours? And, and if it does, is there anything that people should either stop eating or start eating to slow down that growth? Well, there are these sort of motions to have anti-inflammatory diets. So, um, you know, some people, uh, you know, are moving in that direction. You know, is that is that a way to go? I, you know, I think we need to see some evidence that uh, that that is effective. But as long as the anti-inflammatory diet doesn't do you any harm, um, you know, the concern is people taking medications that have anecdotal information that 
that potentially are harmful. So, you know, I mean, obviously people talk about turmeric, curcumin, you know, potentially, you know, that's been mentioned in a, by a lot of people. But again, there's no good case control evidence that, uh, that curcumin works. But there's, I don't think there's any big harm in taking some, you know, extra curcumin in your diet. By the way, putting extra turmeric on your food is probably not sufficient in terms of the amount you need to have an effect. But yeah, it's certainly possible, you know, uh, you know Grace and Adam are working on the whole inflammation story that, that diet may be part of the trigger, but I think we need more evidence. So that means you're going to have to go chasing two samples, I think, Adam. Yeah. So <laughs> he's not smiling. <laughs> so so, uh, you know. Well, the gut microbiome. You have to you have to look at uh, the gut microbiome, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so so. Uh, yeah. Clearly, sort of. Yeah. So that question around sort of like you know, sort of diet, etc. It's it's around. Okay. So you know, in terms of quality of life and, and longevity. Um, you know, what advice or what are the best ways for, for people with NF to, to achieve, you know, you know, the, the, you know quality of life and, and longevity? Well, I, I, I think the UK model is, is the best we have. That uh, the, the, the strongest evidence is going to going and getting your NF2 managed by an expert center is the best way of, of prolonging your life. And, you know, Avastin, I think, is already having an effect at prolonging life in NF2. Um, the worst thing to do is, is, is to go to some gung-ho surgeon who, who just goes in and operates on everything, or, uh, you know, you get blasted with radiation when you're a child. I mean, you know, radiation has long-term is issues, and, and hitting 12, 13, 14 year old children while everything is growing with radiation is not a particularly good idea. All of the evidence about radiation from Hiroshima through to you know, Israeli children being given radiation for lice, head lice, and getting lots of vestibular schwannomas and meningiomas suggests it's not a particularly good idea. So radiation should not be the first call that's why we need drugs. Yeah. We need drugs that mean that ideally we're not we're not chucking things at people. So the real important thing in NF2 is to preserve function as for as long as you can. And that there is precious little evidence that going in gung ho early does any good and may do a lot of harm. Right. And yeah. and. Uh, I think what we hope for is drugs that are going to make, uh, you know, safer drugs that are going to make a, a big difference in holding off on the necessity to do surgery or radiation treatment. Okay, so 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 we're almost at the end of time. So just so sort of finally, I guess the question, sort of, you're on that sort of, you know, looking at the drugs. So how optimistic are you that you know we might find a cure for 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 NF two? So. Cure, I, I think uh, uh, cure is, is a harder one because I think to cure NF2, you need to be able to correct the gene fault. Um, I, I think much more likely we are gonna have drugs that can halt the progress of NF2 at a stage where someone hasn't lost any function. And that is as close to and as good as a cure you, as you can get. So, I think that's where we'll, we'll get that hopefully we will have treatments that will stop NF2 patients going deaf, stop NF2 patients losing muscular function, ending up in a wheelchair, et cetera. That is my hope. Yes, gene therapy is the ultimate. If we can correct the fault, if we can you know, do that, you know, if, if gene editing gets us that far, that is the ultimate. And uh, I, I would be hopeful, but I think we have a lot more hoops to jump through. And I think drugs will be there before gene therapy will get us there. Right. So th thank you, Gareth, for this.
fascinating conversation, but the insights you shared, you know, I, I'm clearly highlight the sort of the efforts that have been made uh, by, by the research community and organisations such as NF2 Biosolutions. So, so thanks very much. And I, I'm now going to hand back over to Claire for some closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mike, Grace, Adam, Andy, Gareth, and Tony, and Gil, who's been my tech support here. Um, that was an incredible hour, lots of information. Um, we appreciate everything you're doing and the time that you've given to go through that. As I say, as a wife and mum of two with NF2, you know, that this, this kind of chat is invaluable. So thank you very much for all the hope. Um, we're going to be putting a poll um, up for you to answer a question, so please um, answer that poll before you leave, and we'll also get a feedback form, because if we can, we'd like to do this again and um, learn, see how we can learn from this one and, and make it sort of bigger and better. So please fill out the poll for us, and thank you very much for joining. Okay, Claire, everybody answer to the poll. Is that working? Yeah, everybody answered to the poll. All good. There are many, many questions that haven't been answered. And I think some people are saying, can we can we answer some of those questions? Um I don't know if someone wants to collate the ones that weren't answered and uh, yeah, so, I'll have a go at some of them. Yeah, we've been offering, if that's okay, Gareth, we'll collect all them together and... Um, yeah, well, some of them were answered, uh, or at least answered. partly answered. But, I mean, there are things like proton beam radiation effective on, uh, on peripheral nerve tumours. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't want to um, be cheeky and go over the hour <laughs> of your time. Um, so what we could do is we can collate those and um, get them to you if that's okay, and then you, and then we'll send them out um, in a different way if that's all right with you. Uh, so we it, had we had no not informative enough, no too hard to understand, no too long. So, <laughs> so all it. of the all of the comments were were good apart from too short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, with with you on stage, Gareth, people could sit and listen to you all day with all your knowledge. Well, I'd have been on for longer if, uh, you know, if... <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's brilliant for, you know, for the next time. So, you know, if you're happy to, and that's obviously what people want, <laughs> uh, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, and we'll do um, a slightly longer one. And thanks, Michael, for being such a, a brilliant compare. Excellent. Yeah, yeah thank you're you. welcome. Yeah, thank you very, very much indeed. It's been brilliant. Okay, is that right? Yeah, I think I think is that us. I think we're free to go and have some lunch. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Cheers, Tony. Cheers, everyone. Thank okay. you. Everyone.